this is a basic structure in organic chemistry. This is called the benzene ring. These dark black spheres are carbon atoms, regular carbon, and these white spheres are hydrogen atoms, and there are six of each, so that the benzene ring is actually a 12-fold structure. So it's interesting. You have 12 disciples, you have 12 hours of the day, you have 12 signs of the zodiac. All of these are structures that relate to our kind of life, organic life. So it's interesting that the fundamental archetype for organic structure is this benzene ring. Now the first human being to ever understand this was not able to see atoms like this and place them together. He was a um, alchemist named uh, Kukule and he envisioned in a dream a circle structure and when he saw it immediately a symbol flicked into his psyche of a snake swallowing its tail. He didn't see the benzene ring, but he was thinking of the benzene ring. He was thinking of this kind of structure, but he saw a snake swallowing its tail. This is what's known as an archetype, an archetype. That is to say that the traditional symbol manifests itself in the imagination in a mythic mode. And the difference between a symbol in the mythic mode and a symbol in the visionary mode is that the visionary mode will always have a kind of a structure that pertains to the image structure rather than the traditional image association. That is to say, an archetypal symbol, when it comes out mythically, will always be a mother, a father, a serpent swallowing its tail, whatever. Traditional mythic images that have been raised through condensation of meaning, through high powered integration, have been raised to symbols and the meaning of those symbols compacted and finally one comes out with symbol like the earth mother or the sky father or the serpent swallowing its tail one comes out with that sort of thing in vision they're always different their presentation is structural whereas symbols representation happens to be content oriented in terms of an instinctual basis, a ritual comportment, a mythic story line, a symbolic pattern. Now these qualities, the difference between being able to see a benzene ring atom by atom or imagining it to be a serpent swallowing its tail, relate very closely to two knots, two knots in psychic energy. Definition of a knot from today's mathematics is a knot is a one-dimensional self-avoiding complication. In a three-dimensional context, in terms of which it has no reference. A neurosis is a mythic complication which comes together on the symbol level and a phobia is a visionary complication that comes together and on the level of the person. Actually in our education on the level of art.
It has to do with the inability of form to be relationally accurate, both of them. But they're remarkably different in the way in which they operate. But their operation is linked together. And perhaps the easiest memnonic to think about here is the classic term flight or fight. The neurotic tends to flee, and the phobic tends uh, um, in its fleeing to be uh, ab absorbed. The neurotic tends then to want to fight this tendency to flee, and the phobic wants to accelerate the flight so they overcome it. The neurotic is addicted to security, and the phobic is addicted to power. So that the more that one goes into the development of the application, the more remarkable or the more markable are the indications. The quality of the neurotic is that there are no sufficient forms of psychic energy or that the forms are weak so that they leak. For instance, in atomic structure, generally the nucleus of an atom, because it has pairs of neurons and um, protons, and is held together by um, a, a atomic glue, that uh, a force field that's very, very strong. Generally, the nucleus of an atom tends to have a spherical quality to it and be very compacted. But there are states, there are isotopes of matter. Uh, the first one that was discovered uh, was discovered in Berkeley about 25, 30 years ago, uh, lithium-11. And instead of having a nice compact nucleus in regular lithium, lithium-11 has two extra neurons that are outside of the sphere. And so there's a kind of like a halo or a haze. The nucleus of these kinds of atoms are very weak, and it's very easy to disintegrate them, to break them apart. This is a neurotic state. The neurotic is extremely susceptible, over susceptible, to being fragmented. And so the need is for security against this kind of situation and operation. Phobia, phobic is a completely different story, though related. Something phobic means that there are premature forms of psychic energy. They're premature or they're misformed. So that the phobic seeks power to overcome a situation because what you have to work with misapplies itself all the time. It would be like a hammer that's curved and every time you go to to, up, to use it, 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 it doesn't work and so you, you want to do it quicker or stronger or just take anything and make it be a hammer. The only way to overcome both these conditions is to pace development, to pace maturity, and pace it so that it achieves a quality which we would call measure. And I'm using it, I'm using the term measure now um, in both the musical and mathematical sense, measure. The earliest cultural appearance of measure is the ritual attentiveness to periodicity. The ritual comportment to natural periodicity is the beginning of what comes out in sort of Ur language of numeracy, of being able to count.
And that's the whole foundation upon which measure is made. In a way, phobias could be said to be the resultant of swallowing too much air in our psyche, gulping meaning. And in a way, you get a case of the symbol bends. <laughs> Whereas neuroses are like mythic flus. They're symptomatic of meaning drift. Both are functional qualities of inappropriate form. So that symbols are an index, symbols are an index to the patterned form of the integral pacing coming to fruition. And then when those symbols are applied uh, in a differential measured way, they register as completed forms like the person or the work of art or art itself, that kind of activity. This is one reason why the ecumene education takes two years. It isn't a question of trying to reduce it down and have it available in a one week shot or a weekend shot or a series of weekend shots. That kind of activity is destructive. The weekend learning binges are ready made to generate phobias and to go with all the uh, uh, body allergies that we have now in the modern world. It's a, it's a perfect setting for a nightmare. Imagine the image of being in a rowboat and of dipping the oars too fast to try and get going faster, right? Build speed. The oars will make these little whirlpools in the water. Whereas if you row in the right way, you get a kind of an even flow. And even though there is that tendency for whirlpooling, the vortexes will be uh, part of a flow. They will factor themselves into the streamline of the flow. Whereas if you row too fast, you get turbulent water or you get these kinds of whirlpool effects. So psychic energy, so phobias. Now there's a crisscross that happens when they're crunched together so that one has both conditions mixed together in a real tangle where one is consumed with the neurotic need for security and that's transferred to power. So one becomes addicted to power as a security blanket. This is a real chronic situation, and that leads to psychosis. Because no matter what you do, you aggravate one or the other qualities of the tangle. And the only solution is to do nothing. And that, of course, does not occur to someone who's frightened or to someone who wants power. Doing nothing is the one thing that they will not do. So that integration without neuroses takes pacing and measure. And on this particular planet, our whole natural context, the whole natural matrix out of which this happens, is seasonal vis-a-vis -vis an annual year. And so it's no wonder that all of the ritual cycles of our species, no matter what variant, African, Asian, European, Neolithic, Paleolithic, modern, it doesn't make any difference at all, go by the year, the annual year. 
and rituals distribute themselves in such a way that they have a four-part, they have a quaternary, they have a quaternity type of a movement and a cycle. And that it's not just a four-part, but when one looks closer at this, as we did in the first year of this education, it actually, by putting the Hubble telescope mind on it, you are able to resolve it. It's always a pair of pairs. That is to say, the deeper structure is two squared rather than four. So that in traditional ritual, cultural, annual cycles, there will always be a synthesizing axis that, in its diameter of the year, organizes two opposite points on that cycle. The culture will either relate to the solstices or to the equinoxes. Now they'll take into consideration all four, but they will put an emphasis on one or the other. Differentiation without phobias takes phasing and completion. That is to say, forms that obviate a neurotic sidestepping require a perfection, and forms that obviate the phobic reaction require completion. So that integration has, at its core, integration always has this need for perfection deeper. Let's not even use the term need. It is a requirement for perfection, which is structural, which is built into the process, which can be masked by a neurotic desire for security and by trying to make the perfect a source of security. One is only secure if you attain perfection, and this leads to tyranny of the uh, male, of the masculine. Whereas in the differential process, it tends to go to its complement, where completion is veiled and masked by this overweening taste for power, and this leads to a tyranny of female. Now these qualities are not, they're not psychological. These analyses are not like a textbook thing. These are expressive qualities. These are powerful conceptual ideas that emerge clearer and clearer as one investigates. Now, let's take this structure of the benzene ring. You wouldn't want to taste benzene. It's one of the constituents of gasoline butene. No one in the world would even want one molecule of benzene on their tongue. But a slight modification of this, taking the benzene ring and putting two ox three oxygen atoms and um, one, two extra hydrogen atoms. Can you imagine just two hydrogen atoms and three oxygen atoms and benzene becomes vanillin. <laughs> so the adjustments, the masking, the veiling, is not like there's a huge distortion. It's like minute. It's like basically minute. 
so that very advanced consciousness that understands exactly what it is is very difficult to come by. That kind of differential level of consciousness is, is very rare, very profound. But the basic quality of being able to taste the difference between benzene and vanilla, even on simple primitive level, even a dog could tell the difference. So the effect, the feeling effect, the emotional effect is very early, but the accurate structural understanding is very late. And because of that differential, an education like this not only has to develop pacing and measure, but also to encourage us to go ahead and work without knowing, work in the unknown for a long time before there's any resolution that one could then depend on. Now, classically, wisdom traditions built this in, and they built it in on on the most fundamental level, on the level of uh, children in a culture. One of the most sophisticated analytical systems that human beings ever developed is what is known classically as Buddhism. The historical Buddha was one of the greatest analyzers of the integration process ever. I don't know if you know this or not, but in deep meditation, one can resolve um, a structure. So instead of seeing the natural images, one can see the symbolic structure. You can do that. Kukule could not do that, but Siddhartha could do that, could see that, uh, that particular structure. Um, and one doesn't have to be as advanced as the Buddha. I mentioned to you one time, uh, uh, when I was younger and, and, and caught up in a particular knot and, uh, and of course, uh, uh, like every, anybody else, phobic about it, wanting to overpower it, just get at it. What was it? Let's get at it. And uh, up in the uh, Sierra Nevadas, up above uh, Lake Tahoe, uh, in the summertime, up in the Heavenly Valley uh, 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 ski area, say, came to a decision on seeing this little grove of dogwood and this kind of big boulder rock, Western Sierra boulder, that we're going to have it out right here. And just coming with that problem, with that knot, with that phobia, with that, that complication to that archetypal setting of the little grove and the rock. And this is the anvil upon which, you know, do or die. This is it. And flicking off the rucksack in such a way, you know, seeing too many Kurosawa movies at 16. And out of the rucksack tumbled in midair a little juice can. And out of the side of the eye caught the glint of the can as it, you know, rolled off down the scree. It sat there, high-powered samadhi went into resolution very, very um, precise, and all of a sudden floating up out of that was this uh, leaden silvery gray oval, and in a nice blue script it said sun-kissed. Came out of the samadhi, rushed over and grabbed that damn little can, and looked at it, and there it was. That all of that exact information was encoded on a glint of sunlight out of the corner of the eye. And that could be resolved in meditation. Just like they used to have little divinatory things in the 40s and in cheap restaurants in, in the Midwest where you would take this ball and you would hold it upside down and out of the murky stuff would float some kind of little piece of black dice with some words on it giving you your fortune of the day. It was just exactly like that, that kind of a quality. Faulkner, in his uh, great story, The Bear, which is a section of his uh, fantastic novel, Go Down, Moses, taken from an old uh, uh, 
black uh, American folk song, Go Down Moses, Tell Old Pharaoh, Let My People Go. It's about freedom. It's about winning freedom of being able to go, to leave this knot, this complication. And in The Bear, the young white boy, the southern white boy, Isaac McCaslin, he is out in the big woods for the first time with the men, all the white men, and they're hunting. And the biggest game in that big woods is an old bear that almost nobody has ever seen. They know he's there. And they basically go there to hunt the deer and occasionally talk about maybe hunting the bear, but they mainly go to drink and swap stories like southern men used to do. But the boy is still young enough. He wants to learn to hunt. He wants to go after that bear. And Sam Fathers, who's half black and half American Indian, half Chickasaw and half slave, tells him that you're not even going to see that bear boy unless you become a part of this forest. You've got to be a part of the big woods because the bear, he is the master here. And you're not going to be able to see him until you're a part of the big woods. Well, how do I get to be that way? He said, well, you have a lot of disadvantages, boy. You got a gun, you got a watch, and you got a compass. And none of those measurements, none of those measures apply to the wholeness of the forest. And so you got to set them aside. You got to lean your gun and your compass and your watch against a tree and leave them and join mystical participation. You have to join that woods, the big woods. And when you do, because the big woods is one thing, one pattern, and the bear is always at the center of the big woods. As soon as you do, no matter where you are, the center will manifest it for you. And sure enough, Isaac McCaslin, the boy, leaves his stuff, and he goes wandering around trying to become a part of the forest, and he thinks, well, I'm just lost. But the whole sense of being lost, if you don't give into it, because the sense of being lost is the trigger for the neuroses. And if you don't give into it, if you just go with it, what did Huxley, Aldous Huxley once said, the saint, the mystic, swims in the very water that the neurotic drowns. You just go with it. All right, I'm lost. Well, let's be lost. We can play that role, lost. And as soon as he does that, he s takes one more step and he comes out into a clearing and he wonders, well, where am I? And he sees his measures leaning there. He's back exactly where he was. And as soon as he does, he looks up and he sees that the bear is there watching him. And Faulkner, in a beautiful way, Remember the sun kiss can and the way the thing came right up out of psychic energy, just like one of those Midwest divination things. Faulkner says, the bear doesn't move at all, but fades back into the big woods. As if he had been like this big old carp in a murky pool without moving a fin, had just drifted down out of sight. And Faulkner expresses how this central synthesizing symbol that gives form to everything and obviates neurosis forever has a quality of allowing for unity to occur. The most perfect form of all is unity, one. Oneness. Uno. So that the the inoculation against neurosis for all time. The inoculation is one experience of unity, of oneness. The Chinese term for that was te as in Tao Te Ching, Te, oneness, oneness. 
but for oneness to emerge for integration, for there be something to be integrated to oneness, there needs to be a context that allows for oneness to occur. And the only context that exists or non-exists, the only context at all for oneness to occur is zero, void, empty, with a big smile and a capital E, empty. Because only with empty can unity be a form. And so in a differential mode, consciousness is saved, is cured from its phobias forever by the emptiness of infinity. And those two complement each other and go together. The first threshold at, at which that is visible is in art. Before that, there is no opportunity whatsoever to be aware or sensitive or imagine or in any complication or any variations of complications to even get a glimmer that this exists, that this is possible, that this is desirable, that this could be worked towards. And so a traditional wisdom education always pays attention at the very beginning, at the interface between ritual and myth, at that interface. That threshold is the threshold of the beginning of stories, the beginning of stories. In classical Buddhism, in order to introduce those wonderful children's stories about the Buddhas being able to resolve to nothing, um, they developed a whole series of stories of the Buddha's previous life as animals, various animals, and they're called Jataka stories. And you can see in translation, it takes a lot of pages to tell all the stories of the Buddha's previous lives when he was like an animal. He was a monkey one time. He was a deer one time. The Jataka tales are the children's stories that are essential and necessary for later being able to master the structural complications of the Abhidhamma. And in between the Jataka tales and the Abhidhamma, is just simply the practice, the meditative practice of doing realization. That's all. Not theorizing about it, not hoping for it, but just practice, 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 doing. Because that practice then absorbs the ritual forms, symbols, that symbolic level, because they're very powerful, can absorb those ritual actions. The ritual forms of actions can be absorbed into the symbols. And the meditative focus is so powerful, it's like a, dare I use it, it's like a black hole that absorbs any kind of energy. It'll take anything and realization will absorb all of it to a vanishing point. So that unity, when it is itself, when it is oneness, factors into a zero base without leaving anything behind. If one were counting, in orders of ascending powers or descending powers, there's nothing to carry over. One factors into zero without leaving a trace behind. A wisdom education always includes the experience of being able to go through this on your own.
because the little the little snag, the little burr that would lead to all kinds of knots and complications all again is if you let someone else do that for you or if you depended on someone else to tell you how to do that or if you assumed that you had already done that and someone didn't catch you up and say, well, no, it's not it. We told the story about uh, Milarepa, when Milarepa was running the most powerful meditative community probably since uh, Jesus of Alexandria. His, uh, his monastery was Mount Everest. Melarepa was a kind of giant toughie. It was a John Wayne of meditation. And so he used Mount Everest as his camp. And the most uh, powerful intellect to ever come and study with him was a man named Gampopa, who, whose book, uh, The Jewel Ornament of Liberation, is available in English translation. And Gampopa came to study with Milarepa, he'd mastered everything, but he had done it in such a way that he had gulped the zero. <laughs> and no one else could diagnose that except Milarepa. You could see it right away. He did everything right. He knew everything. But he had a phobia about realization because he had gulped the zero. So Milarepa said to him, being a nice doctor of the psyche, he said, I want you to tell me about your dreams. So whenever you have a dream, come and wake me up. doesn't matter what time it is. Come and wake me up and tell me immediately what that dream was. And for a series of about 25, 26 days, every night, Gampopa had more and more dramatic dreams. They got to be Wagnerian productions. And he would wake up Milarepa and he would tell him, well, this is it, right? Solid gold meteor showers and the, the, the whole thing. And he would politely say no, sometimes not so politely. But when the productions got to be Andrew Lloyd Webber, where it would take most of the rest of the early morning hours to tell the dream, Milarepa threw him a curve, right? You have to have a, a kind of a curve. In baseball, it's called the slider. It's a, it's a curve that's a little off speed. He said, none of these dreams are right. It's all crap. And I don't know what the Tibetan word for crap is, but it, but it reverberated. And so he was, he was embarrassed. And the next night, he didn't have a dream at all. And he was so ashamed, right? It's like he had this pilot light of greatness going and, and it was blown out. And he left. He, he, he went back. He went back to his, his uh, university where he was teaching. And, and he thought, I've blown it forever. I'll never be enlightened. My, my one chance, the one great teacher in the universe, and I, I blew it. I had no dream at all. And then he heard uh, about a year later that Milarepa had passed on, had died, and he thought, well, I never, never in all reality will be enlightened. And so he let it go. He got up and walked out. And as he walked through the threshold of his own door, he looked and he saw he had about 5,000 high-powered yogis studying with him. He realized that he had been passed the baton of realization. He was, in fact, the, the great teacher of the Vajrayana. There's the proof. And that by having no dream, have nothing to tell, that was it. That was the liberation. You don't need a master. Though. You, you are the master. So it's that kind of a quality. We don't have to have those kinds of large productions, but the cure for the neurotic syndrome is not to jump from the frying pan into the fire, 
and get into the proliferation of the phobic. And of course, the modern world is just simply a swim in phobias. We have as many phobias as the uh, Victorians had neuroses. There's been no advance whatsoever. They've just been shifted from this kind to that kind. So we have a negative, obverse Victorianism where we need power surges to get through the day. And this kind of addiction, particularly virulent because it does not allow for art to occur at all. And it does not allow for persons. One simply in expectation steamrollers over the delicate little thresholds where the defining qualities of the person are made. The most tossed away values in the world today are the quiet values of character building. No one wants to hear about that. No one wants to spend time on that. Kindliness, patience, forget it. It doesn't swing. Let's go. Magic mountain. <laughs> if we go through enough of these things, right, we'll be ready for anything. They're going to pass out bandoleros with, uh, you know, 23rd century machine guns so that you can ride in style. And you're still going to be caught because that's not the way out. Now, it shows up in art, especially in arts where the relational qualities of form and space are accentuated. So that the number one place that it shows up is architecture. The ur mother art is architecture because that's where form and space, phobically not, quicker than any other place. It's rare to be in a building where the architecture is balanced so that the character qualities are alive there. And yet when you are, it's there's no doubt about it. There's an ambience of somebody at home. Now the best structure in the Los Angeles area that has this is the Green and Green Gamble House in Pasadena. If you can take yourself there and sort of just blank out the kind of uh, kindly docent tour palaver that goes on. And just be in the house. Just be in that house. Just merge with that house. Another one is the Ennis House, the Frank Lloyd Wright Ennis House, uh, which is only open, I think, uh, uh, one Tuesday a month up on Glendower. I used to own a place about a block away from it, the big Mayan brick uh, place. Manley Hall, when he was first starting in the 20s, used to live up there in that place. The Ennis House has that quality also, where there's such a perfect balance between form and space that if you can give yourself over to it, the architecture absorbs everything. And instead of leaving nothing for you, gives you everything, gives you the building gives you the architecture. So the, the experience quality does a sudden, it's like a uh, hourglass, right? Beautiful, beautiful shape of, of acceptance. The building accepts you. The architecture accepts you. I used to be able to do it with the Holly Hawk House, but uh, there's so much construction around there now, it's, it's kind of distracting and there have been modifications. But you can still uh, approach that kind of quality. If you get a chance to travel, one of the most successful buildings ever that did this was one of Wright's churches in Madison, Wisconsin, a Unitarian church. I, um, I saw a production of Ibsen's When We Dead Awaken 
in that structure one night. And it was so colossal, everybody was just speechless afterwards. Ibsen's When We Dead Awaken was his last great symbolic play, and someone once described it as a magical carnival of complication taking place underneath a canvas cover, and you can only tell what's going on by feel, and only by conversing with everybody who was there in that experience together can you even begin to approximate the mystery and magic of what had occurred. The play is very, very difficult. But in that building, Ibsen's When We Dead Awakened just simply opened everyone up that when you came out of the building, the front of the building is like uh, hands that are praying like this, but it's all glass, about 50 feet of glass bubble. And then the roof uh, is like a sheltering structure and comes back in such a way that the interior space are like balconies that are like rock ledges of the Wisconsin uh, hilly terrain. And it gives you the sense not only that you are secure, but that you are secure so that you can be let go to be. And I remember that night of coming out with everyone else just stunned by Ibsen in this right Unitarian church into the cold, Madison, clear winter night, pristine snow everywhere, bright uh, blue, uh, black sky with all the stars. And you just, you felt like a benediction. You felt like that quality of art had touched everyone so much that you felt like you were all a family. Same family. You didn't know their names, but you knew that they knew what you knew. That all of you, had been adopted into the universe and that it was okay. It doesn't matter what it was or what will be. It's all right. Art has that benediction quality. Great art does that. It welcomes us out of the universe and into the cosmos. Let's take a break. This is the entrance to Frank Lloyd Wright's Hollyhock House, built for Eileen Barnsdall. And this is the exit from the same structure. And you can see the perfect symmetry, not just of the structure as it is, has a static pile of concrete and wood and so forth, but the perfect balance of the process of participation in the structure. The entrance and the exit are perfectly balanced. And this is a quality that converts the balance of a structure to the process of participation in the structure. We were talking this morning about um, Gampopa studying with Milarepa and coming to the realization that he had indeed attained that quality of perfection by having no dreams at all. In his book, Genius and the Mobocracy, reprinted here by uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, um, Frank Lloyd Wright, Foundation, 1949, and reprinted 1971. Chapter 2 is entitled, By Self-Sacrifice, the Honest Disciple Must Himself Beget the Deeper Experience That Makes Him Master. By Self-Sacrifice, the Honest Disciple Must Himself Beget the Deeper Experience That Makes Him Master. Now, this is a quality that can best be exemplified by the progression that was developed by Plato about 2,400 years ago. Plato uses as the operative symbol of the master, not himself, but Socrates. 
and Socrates through a series of dialogues. Plato's works are like Shakespeare's plays. They form whole cycles, and the cycles together form a complete uh, pattern. Shakespeare's plays uh, collect themselves in pairs and in quaternaries, and uh, so do Plato's uh, dialogues. And these groups of four come together, so you have 16, and then you have this whole structure. The quality that Plato uses progressively in his dialogues is that Socrates shows that no matter what opinion that you have, the Greek term for opinion was doxa, no matter what opinion you have of anything, you can always modify that opinion so that opinions are the kinds of things that can change very easily. And you can inform your opinion, and these informed opinions are always better than the natural, initial opinion that you had. But the informed opinion itself, the more informed it becomes, the more susceptible it becomes to a pro and con dialectic divisiveness. An untutored opinion is capable of so many variations that it's very difficult to notice what is pro and what is con. It's just a jumble. But the more concentrated an opinion becomes, the more susceptible it becomes to the dialectic of pro and con. And that at a certain threshold, one can take either pro or con. It makes no difference. There's an ambidextrousness. Socrates shows you take either side, pro or con, and I'll take the other side. That when we have gotten to a refined opinion deep enough, the pro and the con will always dialectically evoke each other so that you can follow either line, and both of them come to a resolving angle of vision. And if one can follow either the pro or the con deep enough to the resolving interface where the two come together, that point is the central universal form of the idea that was there all the time, that your opinion was just a superficial surface, like a veil, always changing, always being modified by the slightest little circumstances. And the more refined that it becomes until it gets down to a point where it does not change. The Greek term for that point was aletheia, truth. That's the truth of this matter. So that the Platonic dialogues are a journey to truth. They're a journey from opinion to truth, from doxa to aletheia. And progressively, as one takes that journey, Socrates, who begins by being the undisputed master, yields more and more to the participants so that the participants become the master and not himself. He teaches what is called Socratic wisdom. Socratic wisdom is distinguished by not knowing anything in particular, but by knowing that you do not know. So it's called Socratic uh, ignorance. It's being wise enough to know that you don't know. And as long as you keep the tone of remembering that you really don't know yet, you're still on an active movement down to truth. If you at any point fudge on this process of discovery and decide that at this point I know, then you have just created a phobia. 
because truth discloses itself, you don't decide. So that part of the wisdom of the Platonic dialogue process, which is the same as in the Shakespeare plays, is that there never is a point at which you make a judgment that I know the truth will disclose itself and that moment was known by the same term in ancient Greece as we know it today. It's called aha. <laughs> <laughs> the Hollywood version is, oh shit. <laughs> it's, it's the it's the realization, it's the disclosure itself that this is where all of the pros and cons come to a resolution, a resolving. And the whole wisdom process of Plato, as in the wisdom process of Shakespeare, as in the wisdom process of, of Homer, or in Rembrandt, or in Beethoven, all of the really great artists, and remember now, Plato was a very great dramatic artist. The dialogues are, are internal drama, very good drama. All of the movement of integration keeps on as long as you are able to keep a quality of suspended judgment. Yes, you can make judgments, but please don't. Suspended judgment. So that when it comes to aesthetic experience, one of the most fundamental principles is being able to suspend your judgment. You can exercise it later, but right now, suspend your judgment. Sometimes it's called, as in the existential aesthetics of Maurice Merleau-Ponty, Jean-Paul Sartre, it, it is this same quality of mystical participation. The Lucien Levy Brule quality of primordial man. I used to call him primitive man, but we've since learned there's nothing primitive about primitive man. He's primordial. One continues in the process of suspended judgment and revelation of discovery until one comes to a point at which the disclosure will occur all of its own. One of the happy words that was used in medieval mysticism for this event was called showing. And Lady Julian of Norwich, one of the greatest mystics of all time, entitled her written accounts of these showing showings, that one participates with suspended judgment in any course of activity, starting from any particular opinion that one has about anything in the world. And as long as you stay with it, it is an unbroken movement towards realization. The knack is to not interfere with it by chopping it into compartmentalization by making judgments. Now this whole process of non-judgmental quality is in no way the same as the idea of non-judgment. The idea of I'm not going to make judgments is itself a judgment that does more to dice up human lives than anything else. It's called bullshit Zen. I'm not going to make a judgment. Those are fighting words. Notice how paradoxical it gets when you get down to the profundity of it. There's always an irony. There's always a paradox. And that polarity of pro and con, that dialectic of pro and con, when it reaches the self-disclosure, the presentation mode of Aletheia, the pro and con dialectic 
transforms and it no longer is a dialectic of polarities. They transform and they become complementarities. And they work together ever after that. But one has to go through that magic point. One has to go through that threshold. And the threshold is not one that you make yourself, but one that you participate with, especially by suspending judgment, but not by making an idea out of suspending judgment. This activity kinesthetically feels like play. When you do it, it feels just like when you were a child or a kid playing. It has the same kinesthetic quality as play. And so occasionally, in retrospect, many people have described it as the play of the gods. Divine play. Lila. Maya that this is what is always going on in this universe. And because characteristically, it is the primary functional tone of the universe, the retrospective conclusion is that the universe must be alive because only living entity would do this. This is an activity very distinctive of living entity. So that the conviction later on, in retrospect, that the universe is alive is not one of crossed fingers and crossed toes and crossed eyes. Geez, we hope that we're right. Because if we aren't, we're all in terrible trouble, right? You don't have to do that at all. You can uncross the fingers, the toes, and the eyes. There's no doubt whatsoever. Because this kind of functional quality does not happen with an inorganic, or what we would call an inorganic process. It only happens with a living entity. That the universe can grow up to be a cosmos means that it was born alive. And this is one of the inescapable certainties of wisdom tradition. There's no doubt whatsoever. Now in this in this development, art, the person, art, is like a prism. It's the focus where a prismatic form obtains. The person, very much like a prism. And by just introducing natural light to a prism, one can get the entire spectrum Now, the part, the portion of the spectrum that's immediately applicable, that's actually usable, does not negate the fact that the entire spectrum is there. When Sir Isaac Newton took a little prison and sat in a darkened room, he recounts this in his classic uh, book, uh, The Optics. He let a little crack of sunlight come in, and it could only come in through the prism. And in the totally darkened room, a rainbow spectrum was projected against the wall. And he realized that natural light must be an integration. It must be composed of the rainbow spectrum. And indeed, a pure white light can be fractionated into a complete um, uh, color prism. The only colors that register for the human eye are from the red to the violet. But with extra instrumentation, sensitive to electromagnetic frequencies beyond the human eye, all the other colors are there as well. And if one could use this, this metaphor, one could tell the color of radio waves if you had a radio receiver. It's just that they don't register as color. They register as a different kind of radiation. 
So that light itself is a unity integration of electromagnetic energy. And its appearance to us in the form of visible light complements the ability for the human eye, because it developed in a universe and on a stellar system and on a planet, where this actually obtains in a very useful way. Only by being able to differentiate exactly the ripeness of a piece of fruit could our forebearer survive. And so we literally emerged out of a natural comportment, a ritual comportment of being able to identify ripeness by color. So it isn't just a metaphor, it's an actual archetypal quality. Art brings back into play that enormous reality in terms of the person. To stretch it a little bit, there's such a thing as the ripeness of a being. And the person is the ripeness of the fruit of being. And there's nothing accidental about it. There's nothing outrageous about it in the sense of it being odd, or unusual, or unique. But it's a manifesting quality of the cosmos. It always happens just this way. If one interferes with this, if one pokes a finger of judgment in the integration process prematurely, you get a neurotic backwash. If you try to push the process by prematurely grasping on to something, then you get a phobic situation. The integration medium, the process of integration, its primal medium comes into focus of applicability where the imagination occurs. But the differential process comes into applicability where memory occurs. And so imagination and memory are like a diagonal on the sphere of applicability. But what's very peculiar about this is that imagination and memory form a complementation. They're not parallels, but they're complementaries. Imagination is a process, and memory is an actual being. The person is the focus of memory, whereas the focus of imagination is the mythic process itself. So that imagination is always an ongoing process, and memory is always someone. So that for Plato, when he is trying to give us a cue, to those who would participate in the wisdom process of his dialogues, he gives a cue that's at the very pilot light fount of his dramatic master, Socrates. Socrates begins his whole process of Socratic ignorance, of being the master of Plato's dialogue form. The, the MC of this dialectic process. His whole beginning is in visiting the uh, Oracle of Delphi, the Oracle of Apollo at Delphi. And he is told there by 
the Oracle of Delphi, who was always a young girl, a young mystic girl, seated on a very large tripod, not a chair, but the tripod was an ancient uh, Mycenaean uh, ritual instrument of sacrifice. She sacrifices her imagination to the god Apollo. And the vapors from this chasm would come up and, and just carry her away into what clinically would be madness. But her madness is a self-sacrifice, temporary self-sacrifice, to allow for the unity of the universe to have a voice and Apollo's voice comes through her. And what Apollo told Socrates through the madness of the Sibyl of Delphi, two words that meant know thyself, know yourself. The only way to know yourself is to stop imagining that you know yourself and to get to a point of realization that you can remember who you are. You have to remember to know yourself. You cannot imagine. It is impossible to imagine who you are. Why? Because who you are is prismatic and not at all capable of being anything other than a factor of integration. The whole integration process includes you and only by mystical participation with it, letting yourself be non-judgmental and go with it, does that integration process then include you to the point of truth, to the point where the universe presents itself? Whereas the person, as a prismatic form, only occurs in reality in the differential mode. It's like the person is an appliance that is not plugged in at all until one gets into the differential mode. The psychic energy of integration simply doesn't register person anywhere along the line. Why is this so? Because it's universal form. If the person could be real at any place before realization in the integral mode, that would completely usurp the energies of the universe to be a unity, to be perfected, to be whole. And that usurper position is always an ego. It is the ego that usurps this and assumes for itself, sometimes on colossal scale, like Augustus Caesar or Adolf Hitler, that we are the whole reason for the universe to be. <laughs> and if you join us, then you will be real. If you don't, what are you doing there? I don't know. The ancient wisdom saying was that memory was the mother of muses. Memory is the mother of muses. That mother is like the maternal quality of the differential cosmos. And the muses are nine in number. Always when you're dealing with a terrestrial music, you have a seven quality culminated by an octave. They're repeating the first as the first level of, of the next key. But if you're in a, not in a terrestrial music, but in a celestial music, you always have nine strings, seven for terrestrial, nine for celestial. The octave always completes the terrestrial, whereas the 10 completes the celestial. The nine muses are completed by a 10th, which is uh, Apollo himself. 
So it's always Apollo and the nine muses. Memory is the mother of the muses. And in a way, remembering who you are brings into play the nine strings of the muses plus Apollo as the concluding form. And Apollo was always the differential mystical form of the person. The Apollonian is quite different from, Apollo is quite different from Father Zeus. Apollo is in no way father, whereas Zeus is always, always was classically Father Zeus. So that personal form has an Apollonian quality to it. But its Apollonian quality is only apparent when the nine muses are tuned. Well, who are these ladies? They are the pitch pipe qualities of getting in tune with the arts of civilization. There was a muse for epic poetry. There was a muse for history. There was a muse for dance. A muse for astronomy. All the arts that make civilization had a woman, a muse, at the very center of their occurrence. And what held these nine muses together in a completeness was Apollo. Now, if one tries to understand this on the term of myth, you want to hear and read about the myths of Apollo, which are totally different from the arts of uh, civilization. The myths of Apollo involve imagination, whereas the structure of memory, as the mother of muses, involves Apollo in a different in a differential, symbolic, visionary way that leads to art. The Greek epithet in Homer of uh, Apollo, Homer's epithet was, epithet is a phrase that goes uh, with a particular mythic image. Apollo's epithet was far darter, far darter. Someone who has an effect in the far distance. The far darter effect of Apollo occurs where the person is made, completely transcendent to the mythic uh, realm. In fact, completely transcendent to the symbolic realm. The symbolic realm always forms itself in the mind, what we call a mind. And the mind isn't just located here in the cranium. Mind is an actual form. Uh, the entire um, uh, body is there in the mind. If you lose an arm in an accident, uh, your mind will still record that arm there, even though physically it's not. If you lose a child, the mind still records that child as a part of your reality. And on the deep level of truth, when the presentation is there, it's all together. Nothing is ever lost from that wholeness. So the art of person making has peculiarities to it, which are not approachable at all through imagination. They're not able to be brought together through integration. It doesn't matter how perfect the integration is. It just simply isn't there. And if you recall that in our educational, in our wisdom cycle, at any given time, only four quarters register. So that when we had nature and ritual, myth and symbol, all four of those registered together, and they were a wholeness, and that's the unity that the center of which is realization. All this goes together in one whole. 
that the ocean of existence has beaches and that the beaches are a spherical compass. The ocean of existence is the inner waters of a complete sphere, the beaches of which are the realms of the unknown. That's how a mystic would talk. As soon as one goes into, let's use the metaphor from water, as soon as one evaporates into the gas, as soon as one transcends nature so that vision begins to occur, as vision becomes objectively there, nature recedes. So that there is a threshold at which nature completely gives over its place to vision. And that's why the traditional name for this was magic. That is, nature gives up its place, magic takes its place, and one then lives not in a natural world, but in a supernatural world. The visionary realm is a supernatural world. Not supernatural because somebody is telling ghost stories, but supernatural in its very structure. But look here. Nature was the foundation forever up until the point where transcendence began to take its place so that in a supernatural world, the foundation of it is no longer nature but ritual. The first place shifts to ritual. So you have ritual, myth, symbol, vision. A completely different quaternary. But as art comes into play, art is the second quarter of the differential mode. As art comes into play, ritual loses its effect. And the more that art comes into play, the less ritual that there is. And when it completely obtains, when the person is really there, then the quaternary is art, vision, symbol, myth. And myth is the foundation. Language is the foundation of the person. Language is the foundation of the person, not in any kind of dictionary definitional way, but in an objective, structural analysis. The person, your person, a person, any person, is founded on the language functional matrix instead of the natural. Persons are real vis-a-vis -vis language and not necessarily vis-a-vis -vis nature. What has happened to nature? What has happened to ritual? They are still there in the wholeness, but they don't, um, they don't affect the quaternary. And so they take place more and more in what we would call an unconscious, or what has been called an unconscious, a very a stupid misnomer. Um, I've got uh, several books here on the history of the idea of the unconscious to so bring them out sometime. Jung's idea of the unconscious comes from a man named uh, Edward von Hartmann, who developed it from uh, a lot of uh, very high-powered German philosophy early in the uh, 1800s. It's a misnomer. It's perhaps better, because we have to use a language for this, to say subconscious, in that it's there, but it's below the surface. And so a nice structural way to talk about this is surface and depth. So that the surface now, where the person is real, begins with language, includes mind, includes vision, and includes person. And that person, vision, mind, and language are very stable quaternary. They're as stable a quaternary as is the quaternary that begins with nature, the rocks and oceans of, and principal uh, 
principles of uh, thermodynamics of nature and run through ritual and myth and symbol. That quaternary is very stable, can last forever. But the next stable quaternary also is stable forever. Person, vision, mind, and language is as real as something founded on nature and existence. Just as real. That so-called supernatural realm is as real in the cosmos as the realms of galaxies and rocks and beings are in the universe. There's no problem with that at all. But one of the wonderments, Melville calls it the floodgates of wonder, that when they're flung open, you suddenly realize that there's something else. Something else that was not there in nature, in all of its permutations, in all of its integrations, was never there, becomes visible only when the person becomes real. And when the person becomes real, for the first time, you recognize that there's a third stable state of being. And the third stable state of being is when myth gives up its place to history and symbol gives us its place to science. Perhaps use a little bit different language here so that you can um, get a better grasp of it. It's when language transforms itself into history rather than myth and mind gives up its place to cosmos. And when you have cosmos and history and person and vision, when you have a cosmos that's founded on vision that includes the person and includes history, that's also a third stable state and is as eternal as any of the other two. No way that can be impaired. Once that's achieved, it's, it always is. once achieved, ever, always is, has a boundless quality of presentness or presence. At this state, at this third state, the wisdom tradition about 1900 years ago used to call teachers of this state thrice greatest Hermes. Hermes is a guide Hermes is a guide, a psychopomp, a guide for the psyche, a guide for the soul. The first Hermes saves one in the natural realm. And the second Hermes saves one in the personal realm. And thrice greatest Hermes saves the whole cosmos in its reality. Sometimes called in Asia the Bodhisattva. Once that whole triple cycle of stabilities is realized, one is just completely free forever to go anywhere. Whatever imaginative realms, whatever remembered realms, they are no longer compartmentalizations that are resistances. They are rather um, structures that uh, give form. So instead of being places that you cannot go because of something in the way, all of the resistances are transformed and they become conductors. They become thresholds. And when all the resistance compartments of the universe, instead of being resistance compartmentalizations, become thresholds. One calls that in wisdom, freedom. That's freedom. Once when he was uh, being interviewed, D.T. Suzuki, the great Zen master, being interviewed by the young Houston Smith, who at that time was a young philosophy professor at MIT. And he had this stick that he kept hitting his hand. He said, well, Dr. Suzuki, I guess 
they use this in, uh, in Zazen. When the student falls asleep, they whack them with this. Uh, what is that uh, for? And uh, D.T. Suzuki, the lights, floodlights were glaring in his glasses. He closed his eyes and he smiled because he realized, excuse me, he was talking to a child. He said, oh, that has to do with consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> Next week. <laughs>